I'm Nina Kachadorian. Um, uh, I'm going to deliberately misunderstand the furious theme and translate it into curious theme, <laughs> and then try to also speak to my furious curiousness. <laughs> I hope that I'm trying to engage most of the time. This is the cover of a book that accompanies a show that I just opened in Austin, Texas, which is a 30-year um, solo survey show that's d just opened and is going to travel the next two years. And I want to tell you about four very boring projects because I'm very interested in boredom at the moment. This is an image from a project called Seat Assignment where I make work while I'm stuck on airplanes using only what I find and taking the pictures only with my cell phone. I do a lot of things from my seat on the tray table. This is called clock. Some of you may be familiar with these people. Um, th this is me having gone into the bathroom, having used what I find in there, dressing myself up to look like Flemish portraits. They were done on a very, very long flight to New Zealand in 2011. There are about 25 of them. And they've sort of had a weird viral life off on their own, running away from the rest of this project, which is mostly done in my seat and mostly really are more about images like this, where I'm making landscapes using the snacks that get passed out, pretzels, green peas. That's from a series called Proposals for Public Sculpture, where I've taken the lemon wedge from my drink and tried to make this kind of corporate looking thing. Um, so it's about trying to improvise on my feet, trying to really believe there's always more there. <laughs> Lately, my finger has become this character that kind of punctures the page. That's a sick finger, that's a friendly finger, that's a tsunami finger, maybe. Um, and there is a lot of humor in a lot of what I'm making um, in these situations, but I think there is also a lot of anxiety, and I think that travel and airplanes are full of that, maybe more than ever recently. So this is also a place where some of these thoughts erupt. I think a lot about profiling, about racism, on plans about any number of too many examples we have recently for how these kinds of things play out in this moment of fear and paranoia and uh, madness, <laughs> I think, that we're in the middle of. Um, so um, I also made a project that culminated this year at MoMA for MoMA, which is about another one of my favorite boring subjects, which is dust. And it was really inspired by this location, which is a very dusty ledge up on the uh, up on a, a window overlooking the atrium in a gallery that's um, that's high up off the floor, and that ledge is very hard to clean because they have to get up on this giant lift to do that, and they can only do it a couple times a year. So here, um, Pete and Hector are collecting dust for me from that ledge. Um, <laughs> What I ended up making over about two years of time was an audio tour that um, has actually just been extended for six more months. It just closed and then, then it just kind of continued. So you, you can go if you're curious. I interviewed a lot of people at MoMA who work in very different parts of the museum. And part of the project really is also looking about the labor and the efforts of all these different people there to keep the museum clean, free of dust as well as thinking about dust itself, which is both high and low, it's cosmic as well as earthbound, it's sort of the most mundane of the mundane and metaphor laden, as we all know. Problem spots at MoMA include the Brancusi platform, very dusty, they have to clean that many times a week before the museum opens, the helicopter hanging in the atrium, total nightmare, everybody is driven crazy by that helicopter because <laughs> you can barely get to it to clean it. And then I spent a lot of time with conservation. There's some of my favorite people at the museum. Um, we put dust under the microscope. We discovered that dust was not just this gray blob, but had tons of color in it because a lot of dust consists of people's clothing fibers and you know, skin flakes and things like this. But that is the, the colorfulness of the very international dust that shows up at MoMA because it's people from all over the world who visit that museum. Maybe the most surprising story I heard was from one of the conservators who told me that she had cleaned this Picasso painting called Vase of Flowers using her own saliva, which is a very, um, in fact, uh, usual way of cleaning the surface of a painting, but you usually use artificial saliva. It's kind of an enzymatic solution, and she did this using her own, and that kind of blew me away. Um, another boredom-oriented project, this is about eye floaters, which are those sort of drifty things in your eye that you see when you look at a bright sky or a white wall. I'm here sort of striking the pose of a painting I love called The Artist in His Museum, Charles Wilson Peale sort of showing off his cabinet of curiosities there. Um, to do the research for this, I put people in a kind of floater-friendly environment so that they could see their floaters really well. And then I interviewed them about what they were looking at. I asked them, it was like a weird kind of therapy. I asked them like, what are you seeing now? And now what are they doing? And, and the language that came out of this was very interesting to me. They're, they're very kind of strange to describe. They don't stay put, they move around a lot, they remind people of things. They're like moving Rorschach blots in your eye in a way. That's the finished project where it's sort of lushly detailed with velvet curtains and you sit down in front of this little lit um, 
opening and adjust your eyes and eventually you hear a voiceover that I've done in my best fake masterpiece theater. Higher Lean volume. very close to the light and relax your eyes. Gradually, little shapes may begin to appear before you, drifting and hovering in space. Now what you're hearing is what I think is probably the most familiar piece of music in the country. It is the Cisco on hold music. I've gotten very interested in on hold music as another one of these boring topics that I think is interesting. And a while ago, I decided to start collecting it. So I would Shazam with my phone every time I was on a landline to figure out what the song was and then eventually generated this playlist based on all these different and more sources. Then I worked with two DJs, um, Julie Cavello, DJ Shaky, and DJ Stylus, my friend Gabriel Willow, to create an on hold music dance party where we have chopped up and mixed. And Samples like this one, which is one of the strangest ones, I got from a place called Classic Auto Repair in Williamsburg. And try to make this boring, usually sort of undesirable music danceable. And we dressed as customer service people. So we've we've done it twice. It was really a lot of fun, and I kind of want to do it here. So maybe we'll find a way. Thank you. That's it.